Are you ready to take your first steps towards financial freedom by investing in property? Whether you're a first-time investor or you started your portfolio but need some help continuing to grow, 2022 REB Buyers Agent of the Year and Rising Star finalist Lachlan Vidler and his team at Atlas Property Group are here to help. As experts in property investment, Lachlan and his team are ready to help you take your next step in growing your portfolio. By completing the research, sourcing and negotiations, Lachlan goes the extra mile to find you a high-performing investment property. Visit atlaspropertygroup.com.au to book in your discovery call absolutely free of charge. This is a Momentum Media production. Welcome to the Smart Property Investment Show, the podcast by investors for investors. Okay, hey gang, it's Phil Tarrant here, host of the Smart Property Investment Show. I hope you're well. Recording this podcast a number of weeks after the big storms uh, that ravaged um, the eastern parts of Australia um, on a number of different days. It just wasn't one big storm. Normally, we just get a huge hurricane coming through and it sort of puts the cats amongst the pigeons, but we've just had a weather pattern here on the East Coast, which has devastated a lot of areas. Um, thinking back to a couple of days there in belting down, manly sort of underwater, but the big impact up in the Northern Rivers region of, of New South Wales and then up over the border into Queensland. A lot of people are doing it tough right now, big cleanup operation underway. Uh, people are really starting to think about better flood mitigation and management and who's responsible and how we could have done it better. And these are the big questions to ask. You know, it's this big thing about whether or not they should rebuild Lismore in the same area or actually move it on, whether it's global warming, whether it's something else. I like to think that we've got the right people thinking about these type of issues to try and help mitigate and alleviate these concerns moving forward. But that said, um, uh, insurance premiums are going to be hit hard, I would imagine, as a result of that in certain areas. I know I tried to get some insurance for an investment property recently, and they said, we're not taking on any new policies yet. And that's a big concern, right? But um you know, keep at it, keep connected. But for property investors, for those who have bought in areas of Brisbane, you may have thought that it didn't actually sit within the flood zone. Guess what? It probably do now. Um, there's areas that have never flooded before have flooded. So just remember the trials and tribulation of property investor, your best planning. Sometimes you might miss stuff or just stuff will be on your control, but that's the way it works and operates. We want to keep a focus on this. Brisbane and Southeast Queensland, big focus for property investors over the last couple of years, and I think it's really coming into its own now. A lot of the indicators in that area would indicate quite a lot of ongoing growth and development, not discounting the fact there's going to be a big games up there in a, in a couple of years' time. I want to get into that today with a Queensland local, someone that actually knows the market inside out, Matt Schrama. He's the director of the Schrama Group. I spoke to Matt um, probably about three or four months ago, uh, getting a sense for, for his own property journey and where he's going and, and how he's got there and and how he's turned his passion of investing into a profession. So I hope to get an update from him as well. Matt, how are you going? Good, Phil. Thanks for uh, having me, mate. It's always good jumping on. Yeah, it's good, mate. And um, you managed your way through uh, those floods over the sort of start of, start of March, late Feb, mate? Yeah. Look, really grateful, Phil. Obviously, it impacted and hurt a lot of people, and I'm really grateful here on the Gold Coast where I live and obviously – where our business specialises in, you know, it was it was okay. There was parts of the Gold Coast, obviously, that were impacted, but I really feel for the people just south of the border. Obviously, you heard of Lismore, but obviously, even in the Tweed Head region and surrounding, uh, a lot of people from the Gold Coast were affected via, you know, family or a lot of Gold Coast residents actually live just over the border as well. So it had a trail on effect in terms of the economy as well. And yeah, it's a... It's when those moments happen, eh? You, you have a lot of gratitude, you know, around things and what's important in life, eh? Our thoughts go to all those impacted people as they, you know, navigate their way out of this. And, and for many of them, Matt, as you know, it's not like, oh, let's fix it up. And, you know, these things can take a long time. We think back to those summer bushfires um, over that sort of 2019, 2020 period, and, and people are still impacted. They still don't have homes. And when you compound that with all the issues around, there's no tradies around. Any good tradies busy for the next two years. You can't get yourself any materials, and if you can do it, it's 30%, 40% more expensive than what it was a couple of years ago because of those supply chain issues. It's a pretty much a perfect storm, so lots of thinking, deep thinking to take place there. But, Matt, this is a show about property investing, property investors. Uh, you're a property investor yourself. Man, I want to pick your brain today on your part of the world there, mainly around that um, southeast Queensland, the Gold Coast. 
which for property markets is always in the headlines. It's either booming or busting. It's got a story. Uh, the Goldie, you want to get into that, mate? But give me a sense for for your own um, personal journey. We we spoke last time we got together, which I think is the first time we had a yarn on this podcast. Your journey coming out of playing professional footy, um, a couple of wilderness years while you're trying to sort your stuff out and really finding where you wanted to go and where you wanted to be, mate. You're still investing in property? Yeah, well and truly, Phil, obviously. I run a buyer's agency, but in my personal life, I've always been a uh, property investor as well. So I started investing when I was sort of in my early 20s and yeah, portfolio is sitting pretty stable right now, probably around the 55, 60% LVR, circa just under three. And at the moment, uh, five properties sitting between Brisbane and the Gold Coast right now. And in that phase, obviously now business owner, I've been very patient over the past uh, few months just obviously building that up so I can go again. So I'm really looking around tax time this year to unleash and and go again. Yeah, it's a really good point. Uh, A lot of people who have PAYG jobs and uh, they find finance pretty easy. Uh, Let me tell you, as soon as you choose to uh, become a director of a business, particularly a startup or a small business, you've got to do your times before your banks want to touch you again. Sometimes for a lot of people, they're out of the market for two years until you can show a good couple of years of solid financials to the bank and uh, a lot of people, Matt, and you probably see it yourself, uh, they make the mistake thinking, um, I want to be going to business for myself to relax a bit and try and pay less tax, you know, and try and show as minim- minimal earnings as possible. Guess what? Banks don't like that as well, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you've now through that process, you're, you're able to sort of get bank finance again? Yeah, getting close, getting close, Phil. So it's been an underlying reason of uh, obviously turning my passion into paycheck, so to speak. And a big reason is because I want to keep investing as well obviously really grateful obviously get to help people buy property and, and whatnot here on the uh, Gold Coast but it's also helping me in my personal life and leveraging that as well so it's really motivated me to keep grinding away staying patient and probably the biggest tip I can give and like anything in life like when I was a professional sport it's it's the grind that's where it makes you and sometimes delayed gratification is the key to any sort of success I feel so it's that consistent oh, mate, it has to be it has to be yeah, so many people are in too much of a rush. My view, um, yes, they've got this sort of yes, it's good to plan, it's good to, to to have a strategy to get there. You know, I'm more of a you know embrace a philosophy, and and if you get that right, typically the rest of it works itself out. And and you gotta you gotta embrace the grind, right? Whether it's professional sport or whether it's property investing or whether it's business, like good things don't happen overnight. And unless you're willing to get into that grind. And the grind always isn't that nice, right? But you've got to mm-hmm. do the doing for a period of time in order to realise the upside benefit. You know, call it strategic patience. That's pretty much how I how I view it. It's You've got to be patient. You've got to wait, but you've got to be strategic about it. Uh, and that's how you succeed in property investments, how you succeed in businesses, how you succeed in relationships. It's how you succeed uh, in most things. Right. So it's good to hear, you know, things are moving ahead. Uh, what's the next purchase for you? What's the game plan? Mate, I really want to find out. I always like to work backwards from borrowing capacity i guess that's probably the main thing so got a little idea what i might be able to borrow but in saying i've just been head down bum up trying to obviously you know help as many people which obviously leads to more revenue as a company which obviously leads to better uh, profit and loss statements so when i yeah. put in the application hopefully the broker's going to come back boom x amount and then i would like to work off the back of that but i've been keeping a close eye I, sometimes i get itchy feet and i'll jump on you know, your platforms and RP data and do some research for my own sake and have a look. But knowing what my capacity is and not sure of that yet, obviously, I don't want to get too excited. But I really want to, I guess, the portfolio at the moment with the five properties is quite capital growth heavy. They've all done really well in good regions in Southeast Queensland or capital sort of cities, so to speak, good infrastructure around them, most of them being houses as well. I wouldn't mind making a play for maybe a little bit more uh, cash flow or I feel maybe like even things like a duplex pair with medium residential zoning potentially or something interstate is probably on the cards most and foremost is obviously Mm. getting into that land tax threshold now in Queensland. So I want to start spreading the eggs into um, some markets that I feel Queensland was a few years ago. So obviously, you know, I feel Western Australia is doing all right in certain sections. Adelaide's always popping. Um, so there's again, it's always like if there's a deal, there's a deal, right? So the main thing is I feel location does 80% of the heavy lifting. So that's what I'm going to be focusing on, getting in a good location. Yeah, and that, that's good sort of counsel from from Matt there around. You gotta you gotta know what your buying capacity is, borrowing capacity. 
savings sort of stacked up as well. But, you know, to start looking at properties without knowing how much money you've got to spend is absolute folly. You're wasting your time. Wasting your you're, energy. You're, yeah. you're expending your emotional energy and bandwidth around it because it's just, it's just, an, like, it's okay to be familiar and get a sense for what stuff's worth, but, you know, get your finance sorted out uh, before you do anything. Yeah. Um, but Matt, this, this particular podcast, I want to really get into, you know, a real sort of boots on the ground insights into Southeast. Queensland and, and your backyard, mate, which is the Gold Coast. Am I allowed to call it the Goldie if I'm not a local? Is that okay? Mate, oh, look, it's frowned upon, but I, I think it should be fine. Mate. The GC's, <laughs> GC's nice and easy. The GC, <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe I can pass mate, myself yeah. off as a, a GC local, but um, we'll get into that. We'll just go to a break. Uh, stay with us. Back in a moment. Creating wealth through property investing starts with getting the right finance in place. At Finney Mortgages, our brokers specialize in investment loans. We know the ropes to get even the most complex deals approved fast. With access to over 50 lenders, we have the know-how and connections to get better rates, improve cash flow, and release equity fast. So if you're looking for a mortgage broker that gets property investment, book in a call with the Finney Broker now. Head to finney.com.au. That's F-I-N-N-I.com.au today. Welcome back, everyone. Phil Tarrant, host of the Smart Property Investment Show with Matt Sharma, director of the Sharma Group, buyer's agent serving. The good people in Queensland, mate. I've been sitting on property in Queensland for about six years, southeast Queensland, waiting for boom times ahead. Are we there? Mate, it's uh, – well, there's markets within markets, isn't there, Phil? Mm. You know, so if you were to say, well, what sort of asset type is this? You know, there's the high, high-rise high market, there's a housing market, there's, you know, there's all different micro markets within suburbs as well. But I guess the key thing to understand is obviously you'd know this, Phil, like supply and demand is always – the main driver of things. And when I look at uh, your blue chip locations, uh, uh, in particular, I'll use the example like on the Gold Coast where we service, supply and demand imbalance is quite strong at the moment for residential housing. So land content, they're not, there's no more land accessible. So what I'm finding is obviously landlocked places like parts of Brisbane, parts of the Gold Coast, you know, you got the ocean to the east, the hinterland to the west. There's literally no land available yet the demand to get into these areas from owner occupiers and investors has never been stronger, you know, due to the things you guys always talk about. Migration's huge at the moment. Southeast Queensland, there's a lot of infrastructure spending. The whole COVID work from home piece has been a really interesting one. I've found like a lot of the clients we've worked with have purchased on the Gold Coast. They've sold up in interstate, maybe Sydney, Melbourne, or even Brisbane. And, their ability to work from home now has caused them, you know, to, all right, I guess, buy in a location that they love to live and then uh, still earn their good wicket and, you know, live a bit more stress-free, you know. That's been a really common one and I find it really interesting that COVID brought that up, the change in demographic coming into some of these locations. And then, yeah, I guess change in demographic as well when you're getting more affluent families and people, obviously the infrastructure has to change with that. So a lot of the uh, demographics are changing, is gentrifying as well. So um, yeah, it's positive signs. But to answer your question, Phil, uh, you know, if there's a deal, there's a deal, right? And it really depends on the the market itself. But supply and demand is very imbalanced at the moment. I'm, I'm noticing. What are you seeing of this in a or intra in, interstate and intra state migration? Is it people making permanent moves to Queensland, or uh, is is the Goldie the GC getting a like a mixture of people looking for a lifestyle holiday asset but still living in, in some other capital. What are you seeing, mate? Yeah, good question. I reckon the most common is, yes, the owner-occupier appeal. Yep. So they're putting their money to work in a location that's still quite undervalued for what you can get. And obviously, they're getting good capital growth out of that and just living where they want to live, good schools. But a common one actually is investors now, which has been interesting because – it's near homeless levels at the moment in some of these suburbs. Like there was something on a current affair last night as well. But um, to give you perspective, some of the blue chip suburbs on the Gold Coast are sub 1% vacancy rate. Mm. So it's really unfortunate. Like there's actual people in their cars, you know, housing kids and stuff, which is so sad. But I mean, it's great news for landlords. But on the other side of that, it's, yeah, it's hard to see, you know, and it's such a nice suburb. There's people in their car, which, you know, we're in a really good country here. Like you would never expect people to be, somewhat homeless to a degree. So that's been really interesting is people think the sales section of property 
on the Gold Coast is strong. Wait till you see the rental side. It's scary that uh, when a property comes up for sale, you can pretty much get premium rent and some. So people are locking in. Uh, people from interstate as well who haven't found their dream home are, are paying you know, uh, six, 12 months in advance rent. And these are affluent families. So the landlord who owns this asset, you know, he's got guaranteed sort of six months of good solid rent. So the yields are still good because the entry price is still okay when you compare it to Sydney and Melbourne, which is obviously changing. You know, yields are getting smaller as, as entry prices get higher. But I'm finding that's a common one is investors are seeing the yields that are really attractive right now and thinking, okay, it's a landlocked suburb and there's opportunity there. Now, this whole notion of, of homelessness is it's a huge issue, um, you know, not only for Golda, but the wider Australia. We're moving into an area right now where, you know, we're not building enough properties. We've been impacted in the whole building sector. We've got developers going bust because of the cost of materials is, is hiking. These issues two, three, four years down the path are only going to be even further compounded as we think about the migration that's going to be coming in and the demand for property, at least as property investors we're providing you know, uh, dwellings for those who can't yet afford to buy or don't want to buy, um, uh, providing a rental accommodation, which I think is a good service to the nation. Uh, some people may say that differently, that we're raising unnecessarily prices and making property unaffordable. But there is definitely a utility for property investment. But when you think of Queensland, a lot of people are moving up there, particularly your neck of the woods, the Goldie, southeast Queensland, looking for a better life, looking for a better opportunity, looking for a more cost-effective way to live. Uh, it's only going to be exacerbated uh, Time. What are you seeing sort of on the ground right now if you're heading out to Saturday auctions, Matt, or negotiating with agents? How fast is stuff moving? How quick do you need to be in order to secure property at the moment? Yeah. Look, it's still fast, but in saying that, I noticed the I call it the buyer frenzy has minimized a bit. So to give you perspective, if we jump back six to 12 months today, you know, there'd be an open home of you know, it's like a nightclub lineup. You know, you got to wait in line and go in there and then best and final, put your offer down kind of thing. What I'm noticing is, look, purchase prices are still strong. They're still going up slightly every fortnight. I always like to check on the on the sale prices. They're still going strong. So land, again, that whole notion around land is king, you know, is still there because supply is so short, mm. but the frenzy isn't there. So what I'm noticing is, and this is just, a really easy way, I guess, in my business, how judges, if the agents are calling me a bit more, it means, uh, you know, there's obviously less buyers out there. A lot of last year, I was on the hustle constantly. Like I've had to keep on, on top of agents all the time, which we still do, but I'm noticing they're offering us off-market deals and things now. So it's definitely slowed down a little bit. There's a little bit more time to negotiate and which I feel is probably a big part of probably that people forget is I feel you can manufacture, I guess, equity. Like I feel you make your money on the way in with real estate. So I feel you've got to leverage the negotiation phase as best you can in, in markets like this. I think the confidence of window shopper buyers is obviously down a little bit because of the whole flood impact and, you know, they'll take it easy. I had some clients who were ready to go. They were putting things on hold because they got to deal with family impact things. So for the astute investor, there's opportunity when others are maybe not as greedy right now. So, uh, but in saying that, don't think prices are going to hike down any anytime soon. I still feel it's pretty strong. Again, supply and demand is is quite an imbalance. So, and I and I really think you just touched on it, Phil. The whole developer supply issue with builders, it's quite concerning to be honest. If you dive deep in it, I feel that's going to have a really flow on effect in terms of not only affordability, but also the cause of even less rentals available because I know of a lot of projects that are stopping. You know, they were going to house, you know, an eight-pack of townhouse. They're actually just put, pressing port and they're not doing it anymore. So all of a sudden, there was more dwellings. About, all of a sudden, that's that's cut short. So, yeah, builders are going bust. And But then again, if you if you have got an asset that's available for rent, it makes it quite appealing as well. Yeah, and there's a lot of different markets. Um it's an interesting beast, uh, the Gold Coast, mm. and we'll get into that in a moment. But just touching on the on the flood issue or the impact of the floods, um, has it really changed many investors' attitudes towards you know, your neck of the woods there, that sort of the border border regions, border towns, uh, southeast Queensland? People say, I don't want to invest there anymore because it may flood. Um, have you noticed any change in attitude? 
I think it's more the astute investors are always doing their due diligence. So what I find is the rookie investors will just invest because they heard it on a current affair that, hey, this is a good area or they, the Uber driver told them that it's good to invest in this area. So they just go in that area. But the astute investors, I find, do their due diligence. So little things like utilizing council mapping tools is a good tip for buyers out there. Like there's readily accessible mapping tools. You can actually have a look at flood zones and things like that. So just because a whole market, for instance, if a one whole suburb was in the headlines because it flooded within that suburb, there's probably three, four pockets that there's a pocket in there that, that never floods, so to speak. So you just got to be mindful that there's pockets within pockets and you need to be doing your own due diligence as well. Be mindful of, you know, flood zone, bushfire zone, it's kind of thing, sloping blocks. Like there's a lot of due diligence things that I notice the good investors do. That's what separates generally I find that the rookies to the good ones is they they do their due diligence and they make a calculated decision on what they purchase rather than just jumping into something because the Uber driver told them to. Yeah. I think there needs to be um an appreciation for investing in in areas on those sort of the coast um of Brisbane. One thing we can't change is the weather. One thing we can't change really is the impact or force of that nature. Um, if you're investing in Brisbane, you just need to actually have the right risk minimization, risk mitigation plans in place to know, hey, you're investing in an area where all this stuff happens. Then you only go back through time. It's not the first time Queensland's been affected by large national uh, natural disasters. So all the evidence and the intelligence and the research is there to help shape it. We know Queensland gets hit by hurricanes and, and large storm cells um, at different times of the year. We just know that in which you can weather, potentially weather that we know the facts largely. The most recent floods, you know, one of a thousand years, however that wants to be framed, I'm sure they'll work that out at a point in time. They now have new flood levels. Um, will it get worse than that in the future? Who knows? But that's the reality of investing in those particular areas. How do you think the best investors help mitigate those type of issues and, and can still invest with confidence up in those areas? Yeah, definitely around the due diligence side of things. So I always like to put in perspective, you know, there's generally four key parts of due diligence, you know, and if we look closely at two of them, I'd say asset due diligence and location due diligence as well. So what I mean by that is within a location, finding out, okay, which streets did flood recently, which ones are lower lying as well, which ones are on the higher side of the street. Are you looking to do a development versus um, you know, just a buy and hold because that can impact things because obviously there's different levels you need to succumb to it with council. You know, if the flood levels, you need to build up a certain height, I know, on certain pockets of the Gold Coast as well. Mm. And then from, I guess, the asset type as well, like having a look at the structure of it, all those different things, the property itself, getting adequate building and pest inspection and, and seeing different things like that as well. It's just I'm finding the good investors take due diligence seriously, which they should be. And like I hear some wild stories of, you know, people buying, like waiving every condition off the contract and just sight unseen and just banking off what the agent tells them. You know, it's it's quite scary because this isn't an asset you just go to the corner store and buy. This is, um, you know, this is uh, six figures, sometimes seven figure asset that you're going to hold kind of thing. So you're better off doing the pre-planned due diligence before going out there. And I think that's a big tip is whatever area you're thinking of investing into is do the due diligence before even going into that area. Like start understanding the the micro market, start understanding the streets as well and start looking at, you know, what's the zoning in certain pockets, frontages, what's appealing to a lot of own occupiers there because that's generally what raises that capital growth price. And, And then if you can't, do that on your own. Well, then you seek seek help, I always find. So that's what I find the, the best investors do. They know their strengths and weaknesses and they outsource the help. Yeah, mate, well said because I, I see and I've seen it time and time again, uh, property investors spend more time researching which flat screen TV to buy for $1,000 <laughs> or $1,500 versus which three, four, five, six, a million dollar asset to, to buy. And I sit there and I just go, you're absolutely kidding me. Yep. Why, why would you do that? How have you got that frame completely wrong? But, you know, you've got to put the hard work in. And if you don't want to put the hard work in, if you don't have the ability to put the hard work in, if it's not your skill set, guess what? There's people out there who can help you do that. And largely they're called a buyer's agent is what Matt does for a living. Um, uh, so that's a good way to view it. Matt, I want to get into uh, Queensland and particularly the Gold Coast. 
uh, is an interesting market that's got a lot of different sort of moving parts to it, which you don't see in other parts of, of the nation. Um, we'll just go to a break and when we come back, we'll get stuck into it. Back in a moment. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, Phil Tarrant, host of the Spa Property Investor Show with Matt Sarama, director of the Sarama Group, a property investor, but also now helping Australians uh, invest effectively in property. Now, when I think of the Gold Coast, Matt, the first time I went up there, uh, I was, I was, no, I didn't go to school. <laughs> I didn't go to school. So, I, mate, I went to um, my end of school, I went to uh, the Central Coast. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't go, but anyway, I was a well behaved boy back there, but I remember. <laughs> Uh, the first time I went to the Gold Coast was with a bunch of mates of mine in, in university holidays, maybe first year, you know, still the right sort of age. And all I remember of it is going, these huge sky, skyscrapers and we got a moped. You got mopeds and drove around on mopeds, right, and sort of just misbehaved and do what you do when you're that sort of age, right? That was my <laughs> memory of the Gold Coast. I quite liked it, to be fair. We had some good fun down on Cavill Avenue, uh, which yeah. I think was most people sort of had a wayward night there at some point in their lives. But it hasn't really changed that much. It might have got a bit higher, a bit fancier, a uh, bit wider, a bit longer. And there's been a, a real sort of growth over the last 20 years, really, there or longer. Um, the Japanese are in there. I remember everyone was fear-mongering around the Japanese buying up the Gold Coast. You know, the White Shoe Brigade knocking out off-the-plan apartments and condos and timeshares and all that sort of stuff. It's certainly got its particular charm. Uh, the Gold Coast, I, I say, and I probably argue, it's quite unique for Australia. A sort of business meets holiday destination, which meets international tourist mecca, which meets, um, you know, very much everything that is about Australia. You know, most people would know a picture of the Gold Coast if they saw it in the postcard. So you're very fortunate, Matt, that you get to live and operate up there and now buy property in there. But you've got high-rise apartments, you've got canal-based property, you've got hinterland-based property, you've got sort of more working-class areas of, of, of the Gold Coast. It's all in sundry, mate. You know, And that could be difficult for a lot of property investors to work out what do you actually focus on. Uh, a good mate of mine right now is just negotiating on one of those canal properties. You know, it's, It hasn't got like a boat water front. It's got like a walkway in front of it. And there's a lot of that around there, mate. What represents good value in the Gold Coast right now? Yeah, it's a good question, Phil. I guess... The overarching thing to remember, like any market, supply versus demand, you know, and it's funny being from Brisbane originally, I my vision of the Gold Coast was surface paradise. So when I moved down here for my professional sporting days back in the day, I didn't even realize there was all those suburbs south of surface paradise. And what you understand when you're down here is it's an actual thriving economy in terms of like one thing that's really exciting is actually the amount of young entrepreneurs moving to the Gold Coast. Again, not all from interstate, but a lot are. And these hardworking families, but also the infrastructure spending. So it used to be a bit of a boom and bust back in the day, whereas backed on just tourism. So a lot of the uh, good businesses are coming down here now. And uh, it's obviously lifting the whole suburb. And a lot of these good developments are popping up in terms of these really good location in terms of restaurants and some of these big name chefs and whatnot down in Sydney and Melbourne, they're all coming up here and opening shop. So it's only for the benefit. It's definitely changing the whole demographic, which is exciting. But in terms of answering your question, what serves good value? Look, a lot of the value lies, like similar to Eastern suburbs of Sydney, I, I always put it all in Melbourne, the closer you are to the the ocean is generally a good starting point. So land east of the Gold Coast Highway is at a premium for anything, a knockdown block. Like there was one beachfront about a week and a half ago, 800 square meters, dual street frontage on a corner, uh, 13 and a half million. You know, the, the lady bought it for eight and a half back in, I think it might have been September, and she just sold for 13 and a half, which is wild. So because nothing pops up that side of the height, there's no land anywhere. So it's just uh, those sorts of things. As close as you can to the, the beach is obviously where the most – land value is and i really like things with a bit of x factor so knowing which pockets on the gold coast have potential zoning changes whether that's medium or high res and i always like look if you're going for a uniblock obviously keeping to the fundamentals sticking to low density i think there's a lot of these old you know pack of six pack of eight on a really good 800 square meter block on a corner in a really good location we bought for a client and they just got a knock on the door from a developer who wants to buy them all out kind of thing. So there's a lot of good build, good builds happening. So it's around 
attaining as much land as you can. I always feel land to asset ratio is probably the most important thing. So, and obviously scarcity, things on canal, obviously super scarce, things near the beach, super scarce. And obviously uh, if you can hold that with the good yield, you know, you're buying pretty well here for the long term. And what, what's the, like the acreage sort of rural hinterland market, which is getting hugely popular at the moment uh, for people that want all the benefits of living close to, you know, a big center with all the, everything that comes with it, shops, nightlife, everything, but they want a bit of serenity, peace and quiet on, on a bit of acreage. What's the hinterland market like? Yeah, it's, it's surprisingly really good. Like, a suburb, for instance, like Benoga, I think it had one of the strongest growth percentages over 12 to 18 months, which is wild. Mm. It's, you know, it's a sleepy hinterland suburb, but a lot of that wasn't investor driven. It was own occupied driven. So I can't see investors going out there and, um, you know, because still the amenities aren't out there. You're still a drive away from, you can't really, the walkability factor is a big one for investors, I find. If you mm. can get in a location where walkability to your key amenities here on the Gold Coast, beach, cafes, Transport are generally the the mains. So if you can get within walkability, tenants will pay a premium for that. So the places out there, yes, look, still good yields and good returns, but you're limiting your your tenants to you know those, those people who really want that tranquil lifestyle kind of thing. And there are obviously bigger blocks out there, still scarce as well. But I find that's more owner occupied driven out yeah. there, not not as many investors going in, which again could be a good thing as well. But I feel the best growth has been in those, I call it like a blue chip location where you're covering all the amenities, easy access to the M1. So you can go north to Brisbane or south to the border and the airport and still walkability to all the key amenities and schools, et cetera. And what's your prediction for the Gold Coast market moving forward? Um, and it's always hard to talk about a collective market. So based in, in all those high rise apartments some of them are serviced or, or what is that as tight as what housing is or it's very different i was going to say phil probably the main thing to realize with the gold coast there's markets within markets so as an investor some yields look really attractive for some of these high-rise units but if you're looking at a scarcity point of view i always have a look at how many cranes are getting built you know out and about as well and to be honest there are a fair few so because there's such a shortage of uh, supply to meet demand. So I'd be careful of investing in the high density apartments or, or things like that. On the other spectrum, look, if you can attain as much land to asset ratio as you can, as we said, obviously a house in a good blue chip location is serving really well. You know, things like these student, some astute investors we bought for buying these duplex pairs, like two units on the one block in a good location or three units on one block. They've been doing great out of those because you're not only offsetting the capital growth with good cash flow, it's your your obviously land banking as well because obviously a lot of those duplex pair sites are medium residential zones. So maybe you want to do a DA one day, you know. So that that's all an option as well. But yeah, I'd be sticking to your blue chip locations, walkability factors, thinking what the tenant's looking for, and look things that you could manufacture equity through cosmetic always goes a long way as well. So uh, if the structure is good, look, paint, carpet, fans, if you can buy low and rent high, you know, that's always the goal. And and also off market is a big one as well. I always find, think outside the box when you're looking at property, how many mm-hmm. channels are you looking at? Are you, are you getting access to off market property? Because I can tell you now, a lot of the equity organically can come through your price on the way in. And if you're minimizing buyer competition, generally you're getting in for a good, Good price as well. So look at off market deals. And I'll probably close with this question, Matt. We'll cover a lot of ground, but um, you know, how much the property investment is all about where you deploy your money at any given time to give the best best upside benefits, and that's either capital growth or or yield or both, right? It's what we all hunt. Well, how much dough do you need? What's your budget to actually buy good assets in the Goldie? You, you know, you, you're probably not going to get away with three hundred grand, right? Like if you want the good stuff, blue chip stuff, canal stuff, you know. No, try right, but to, to to do it well in the Goldie, what's your budget? Yeah, look, I'd say there's different. I always find around that for investors, and you look look across the board. Like we've worked investors on the lower scale and the higher scale who are looking for bigger sites, like three units on one title in in a blue chip location. But I feel look for high density stuff. Like you, as I said, if you're sticking to the fundamentals with units and whatnot, you can get in a blue chip location east of the m1 
starting at around 550 to 750 could get you a good little unit two bed one bath needs a bit of a paint carpet and would rent for your 600 to 700 or duplexes so you're 50 percent ownership of the land they're they're quite good as well for people who are limited on budget uh anywhere from sort of 700 to a mil can get you a really good duplex i actually don't mind the duplexes you no body corporate obviously just a shared insurance you're still 50 percent ownership of the land a lot of those rent really good because you have access to a backyard which you can up the rent because you can allow pets as well um, yeah. so people have done well there but the best is probably if you've got like anywhere between one to two mil getting those blue chip 100% ownership of land, maybe a duplex pair. We're about to do one off market for a client. It's got a DA attached. It's probably going to fall in the one and a half mil, 200 meters to the sand, north facing rear, DA attached, and there's two dwellings on it already. So that to give perspective, I, I'd say they're the different types if you're looking at that. And then you've got the higher end stuff. You know, We've had high end de- uh, developers and investors, You know, a duplex zoned canal front block probably two and a half mil, you know, and they, they build on it or land bank it for the long term kind of thing. So there's there's all different uh, strategies out there. The short-term accommodation as well is a popular one, but obviously I'd chat to a professional around that because there's obviously different tax liabilities yeah. with that. So, Well, you heard it there first from um, from Matt Sharama. That's good insights, mate. There's probably sort of some deep detail, sort of the realities of investing in, in the uh, time today, mate. Um Super interesting stuff. Uh, it's made me thinking. Wow, I don't have any assets in Gold Coast. Maybe I should look at it. Well, the the one thing I always say, Phil. Look, this is a my broker always gave me this advice when I started my property journeys. Is look, if there's a deal, there's a deal. You know, so it doesn't matter what which market or whether interest rates going left, right, side. If you can identify good value and it makes sense, and you've done the due diligence, well then. If there's a deal, there's a deal. That's what I noticed the best investors do. They assess, they do the correct due diligence. But if you know what something's worth and you're getting it for X amount under what it's worth, well, then, you know, sometimes a deal's a deal, deal is right? a deal is a deal. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> thanks. That's Matt Schrama um, from Schrama Group Director there. Hey, thanks for the insights on your property portfolio and your own journey, but also uh, around Gold Coast. Um, if you're not thinking about the Gold Coast, maybe you need to reconsider. I'm sure Matt's. You'd be happy to take some phone calls or whatever, mate, if anyone have any you around around the Goldie. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Connect. Uh, we do a lot of content online. Matt underscore Sarama, S-R-A-M-A. That's where you can find me on Instagram and LinkedIn. Check, down. Down, check it out. And we write about the Gold Coast also on, on uh, smartpropertyinvestment.com. You go and check it out there. Uh, social media, Smart Property HQ is where you'll find us. See you next time. Until then, bye-bye. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature and does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Guests appearing on this podcast may have a commercial relationship with the companies mentioned. Leverage the power of your super with an investment loan through your self-managed super fund. Our expert brokers can help you invest in residential or commercial property through your super, even if you don't have the funds to buy an investment property outright. At Finney Mortgages, we have access to the lenders who specialize in loans for self-managed super funds so we can maximize your loan amount and get your loan approved faster. To secure your financial future, book a call with an experienced Finney broker. Head to finney.com.au. That's F-I-N-N-I.com.au today.